Hello. Today I have a very special lecture titled The Unsung Heroes of Neuroscience. And Neuroclear, so, oh yeah, sorry, an introduction to Neuroclear. And Neuroclear is a general name for a certain type of cell in the brain, but they're not neurons. Okay? Uh, I thought the title was fitting because despite their importance in neuroscience, they're not talked about that much compared to the neuron. So today I will steal some of the fame from the neuron and introduce you to the wonderful Neuroclear. In that case, let's begin. So first up, a very quick and oversimplified recap of the brain. You can see the cerebrum in pink, uh, which makes you yourself, and then the cerebellum in purple, which coordinates movements and balance, and then the um, spinal cord and medulla in yellow, which they control your vital functions, like your heartbeat or your temperature, let's say. And finally, the midbrain, which you can't really see, but let's say it's it helps you process information. Okay, so you, you would be familiar with that brain over there. That's the brain of a child at birth. Now compare that to the brains of feti at five, week old, five weeks and 13 weeks of gestation. They look like completely alien structures, right? But um, not regarding that, let's take a cross-section of the five-week-old fetus. And if we take a cross-section along any place, we will see this. You can see the neural tube, right? Uh, within that neural tube, there's this uh, hollow part, and that's called the ventricle. Sort of like the central canal that you would have been asked to illustrate in your biology lessons. Okay, so you see the rectangle spanning the whole neural tube? Take that rectangle and rotate it. And if you do that, you will see this. I must say, this is a beautiful diagram illustrating how the um, neural tube develops as it becomes a fully functioning adult brain. The rectangle is on the embryonic side, so um, that, at that point, there are these neuroepithelial cells that are spanning the whole layer, from the ventricle to the ectoderm. Those neuroepithelial cells then multiply. Uh, they multiply and they transform into these radial glia, which, as you will see, are very instrumental in this process. Um, however, uh, in this chaos, you'll also be able to see the familiar neurons. These neurons are formed when they bud off from the radial glia or from their uh, neural progenitor cells in, um, in green, those cells labeled N. Uh, these neurons, when they are formed, they climb the radial glial stalks until they reach their rightful position, at which point they extend their accents, and in that sense, the brain builds itself upwards. However, today I will not be talking about neurons that much, so let's meet our main neuroclea. First up, we have our astrocytes, which are formed when the radial glia retract their basal process, the stalk basically, uh, or from the astrocyte progenitor cells. Then we have the oligodendrocytes, which you probably will have heard of, and those oligodendrocytes cell, oh yeah, they're formed from the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. Yep. And finally, the uh, microglia. Um, the microglia, you can't really see them on this diagram because, and this is very interesting, they don't come from the neuroepithelium. They come from the York sac. So there are these York sac blood islands which produce blood cells, which produce these primitive macrophages. And these primitive macrophages then travel through the bloodstream until they reach the brain. And at that point, they colonize it. They enter it and they multiply. And that's how the microglia joins the rest of its friends. Okay, so to give you a sense of magnitude, could I ask you to guess how many neurons there are in the brain? Shout out now, please. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, how about uh, glial cells? <laughs> Alright. Um, you're, not, you're not correct. Because the answer is not clear. But yeah. <laughs> According to one study, one of the better studies, this is the case. Uh, but I strongly recommend that you search it up yourselves. That's the study name. Anyway, I think we're ready to finally indulge ourselves in some astrocyte facts. Astroglia. So, a bit of etymology here. Astro comes from the Greek word for star. Site comes from the Greek word for cell or hollow. And glia comes from the Greek word for glue, as in the glial cells are holding the nervous system together. However, as you'll appreciate, astroglia are actually much more than that. Uh, for example, you may appreciate that most of them don't even have a star shape. Just in this section of the cerebrum here, 
you can see so many morphologies for the way that they're shaped of astropia. So many. But let's focus on one of them in particular, and those are the epinvinyl cells. Now, because I won't mention them further, I might as well talk about them now. So the epinvinyl cells are basically a distant variant of astrocytes that line the ventricles and then produce these cerebrospinal fluids by regulating the passage of substances from the bloodstream into the cerebrospinal fluids. Sort of like the polycytes in the kidney. And when they do that, the cerebrospinal, cerebrospinal fluid then fills the ventricles and surrounds the spinal cord. And I suppose it has a cushioning function. So that's one function of the astropia. And you will, uh, you will realize that there are so many functions of them, as many as their morphologies. I hope you don't mind me throwing a big boring table at you. What if I say this is only half of the actual table, and that I haven't included the roles of astrocytes in um, higher functions of the brain, such as sleep, memory, or even circadian rhythms? Well, you don't need to worry about these small texts. Uh, let's just focus on the big text, right? So we've already, talked about, we've already talked about the development of the central nervous system. So now I'm going to talk about the structural supports, primary function, homeostatic function, metalloid support, synaptic transmission, and the regulation of blood flow aspects of the astrocytes. I'll try to explain it. So another ology, this time it's physiology, which means the way in which it functions. And astroglia, they exist in these separate domains. They don't tend to overlap, as you see. And this is the domain, by the way. Um, they, once they're in the domains, they extend their branches and they can contact several things, such as synapses, they contact them and wrap around them. They can wrap around these blood vessels, they can wrap around the nose of Ganglia, or even they can contact other astrocytes. And when they do that, they will form these gap junctions. And when they form these gap junctions, these cytoplasms will fuse like the plasma desmata in the, in the plants, as you know. That's when they form a syncytium, uh, together vessel, uh, together hollow, sorry. Uh, so all interconnected, unlike the neurons. Um, here's a simpler diagram illustrating the main function of the astroglia, but let's only focus on the, um, the endphotes, right? that's called the endphotes, that is contacting the blood vessel. If we zoom in, zoom in on an image, we'll see the blood-brain barrier there you can see the blood-brain barrier, and you can see that it, it is um, the endothelial cells are tightly wrapped, the, sorry, the astroglial end feet tightly wrap around the endothelial cells, and in turn, the endothelial cells tightly wrap around the bloodstream. And factors released by astroglia cause these endothelial cells to be tightly bound by these proteins to form tight junctions. I am emphasizing the word tight here, as you may have noticed. Uh, that's because few have the privilege of crossing the blood-brain barrier. For example, um, amino acids or glucose have to pass through the blood-brain barrier to reach the very hungry neurons. And that's why they have these complementary carrier proteins, as you will remember, to, to carry them across the lipid bilayer. You might be thinking, well, why not just open the brain? Wouldn't that allow these substances to, to access the brain better? If you're thinking that, then I dare say you are taking the functions, no, you're taking the blood-brain barrier for granted. Because the blood-brain barrier, it stops pathogens entering your brain. It, talks, it stops toxins harming your brain. It stops these water, um, ions, and neurotransmitters from leaving the brain, right? And also, what was the other function? Yeah, so I forgot I put these up. Uh, maintain blood-brain barrier. The uh, blood-brain barrier protects the brain from harmful influences stops the important substances from leaving the brain. And finally, um, astroglia are very, uh, as I mentioned, um, instrumental in this process because they release these factors. No. Yeah, basically, they um, control the, the contractions of these parasites, which are sort of like smooth muscle, but in the brain's arterioles. So uh, by contracting the contractions, no, controlling the contractions of the parasites, astrocytes regulate blood flow. Uh, by diverting more blood into the regions of the brain where the neurons are firing more. And we can measure this using functional MRI. How brilliant is that? Okay, back to the diagram. Um, so, as I mentioned, the gap junctions allow the, cyto the cytoplasms to be connected, and this gives a, another function to the astrocytes, which is called spatial buffering. 
when there's too much of, let's say, potassium ions, neurotransmitters, or water in one area, the astrocytes spread them out through the uh, tissue so that they're not too concentrated. Because if they're too concentrated in, in one region, they can seriously damage the neurons because the neurons are very fragile. Um, what next? Oh yeah, so it's very short of you know, excess ions, water, or neurotransmitters. And when this goes wrong, when this goes wrong, sorry, when spatial buffering doesn't work efficiently, then uh, you get these things like water buildup in one region. Uh, you get these things like um, uh, neurons failing to fire because the um, membrane potentials are disrupted. So those might be associated with neurode neurodegeneration, stroke, or migraines. So pretty serious consequences. Anyway, now we're focusing on the synapse. Synapse. Once again, astroglial end feet, they wrap around these synapses, yeah? And they have these um, functions of neurotransmitter clearance and metabolic support. Because the spillage of neurotransmitters can be detrimental, as I mentioned. Take glutamate as an example. It's one of the main neurotransmitters of the brain. And astrocytes, um, they help recycle glutamate by taking it up, inactivating it, and releasing the inactivated version of glutamine into the extracellular fluid for the neurons to absorb it and reuse it again. Okay. Um, that's brilliant. Yeah, it always happens. <laughs> yeah, uh, because when glutamate is um, in its active form, uh, it, if it remains or if it spills out of the synaptic cleft, then it can cause this thing called excitotoxicity, which can kill neurons. And uh, that does not function correctly in, uh, what was it? Let me just remember the name. I don't remember the name, so let's just skip it. Also, the other function of astroglia is they um, provide lactate, which is a fuel uh, for the neurons. They do this by building up their glycogen reserves, and when the neurons are firing, they convert their gly glucose into lactate for the neurons to take it up once they release it into the extracellular fluid. As you can see here, look. Um, and you can see how greedy the neurons are because despite the glucose being uh, accumulating fa fairly evenly, neurons use a, a far larger share of the energy than the astroglia. So basically, astroglia spoon feeds the neurons. Okay. Uh, so while you contemplate the importance of astroglia, I'll just quickly move on to the oligodendroglia. You might have heard of these from your specification, um, but if not, they, you will definitely have heard of the Schwann cells, yeah? The Schwann cells, yeah. So oligodendroglia have, the, have a similar function to the Schwann cells in that they myelinate axons. But this time, instead of myelinating one axon, they myelinate up to 30 axons in white matter, mainly in white matter. So the white matter that I'm referring to is that section, and it's where the axons are, where the axons of the neurons are. Which, is, which, compared to the, which can be compared to the green matter where the cell bodies and dendrites are, right? Uh, so an oligodendrocyte might be looking like this, might have lots of axons, that's in the cat cerebellum. Or, um, oh, and they myelinate during early childhood development. That's why babies can be very clumsy because their myelin hasn't fully formed yet, so they lack the proper coordination. And that's how they do it. They wrap around, they wrap these processes around the axon. And when they're unrolled, they look like these trapezia, which is very interesting. Okay, moving on. Uh, so talking about myelin, um, I assume all of you have a very good understanding of the mechanisms behind the saltatory conduction. Yeah, all of you understand it perfectly, so I'm just gonna skip it. <laughs> because, yeah, um, basically, myelin speeds up the conduction and reduces the energy used in transmission, which is well known to you. And by doing that, um, despite looking like spaceships, by um, helping speed up the impulses, myelin has allowed the axons to shrink in diameter, and um, it, has, it has protected the axons, which allowed for the faster communication of information uh, from between neurons from around the brain, giving us high abilities like thoughts. And they also, myelin play a role in the metabolic support of the neuron, of the axon, because um, they are very interdependent. If the oligodendrocytes uh, don't function, then the axons will die, 
And if the axon, there's no axon, then the oligodendro here will be wiped out. So you can see that uh, myelin is pretty important in general. That's why the dysfunction of which can cause a part in multiple sclerosis and um, other conditions play a part in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Uh, not, their sole, not their sole cause though, although um, basically yeah, some of their symptoms might be associated with the brain and myelin. Yeah. Speaking of dysfunction, there is one type of cell in the brain that is particularly suited to combat that, the microglia. As you remember, microglia are, uh, were once primitive macrophages that invented the brain tissue early development. You might call them the immune, cell, immune cells of the brain, the immune system of the brain. Um, but I will assure you that microglia have more, have much more to do, no, no, sorry, their functions are much more than just clearing up debris after damage or fighting infection. They have a role in the synaptic plasticity. So in early development, up to two years, they assist in the formation of new synapses, and afterwards, they prune the synapses. They uh, touch the synapses, they check whether they're, whether they're useful or not. If they've been used, they spare them. If they have not been used, they perish, they become swallowed in phagocytosis. And that's the same with neurons that don't communicate, redundant neurons. And um, this concept of survival perish creates an opportunity for humor. So I hope you appreciate this meme I made. <laughs> okay, I expect more laughs. Oh well. um, yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, what you just saw was the resting state of the microglia. Um, when they're in their resting, lake, resting state in the normal brain, they constantly extend and retract their processes to survey the environment. And they're very efficient at this because the, the whole brain is surveyed completely every three hours. Uh, so yeah, they randomly scan the environment and have separate territories. They don't overlap that much. Now compare that to the um, brain in which a viral, yeah, a virus has been injected. Do you see the difference? They've retracted their fine processes, and they've done this by dissolving parts of the cytoskeleton that are keeping the fine processes in their shape. And once that happens, the processes become retracted, and also the microglia acquire the ability to multiply and phagocytose. They can carry out phagocytosis now. Basically, they become chubbier and more defensive. Right? However, that's not their final form. Let's say in severe injury or damage, for example, the um, cell death of neurons, microglia irreversibly transform to this state. That's very different from the first state, the resting state that you just saw. But yeah, they irre irreversibly transform um, to be able to engulf foreign objects, but, but also move to the site of the damage using amoeboid movements. Now, this is how amoeba move. You might have heard of amoeba. Uh, and it essentially involves taking parts of yourself from your rear end and putting them at the front. All the while, the vesicles move the cytoplasm forward. That's how they move. So it's probably uncomfortable to think about the microglia moving through your brain, just pushing, squeezing, wiggling through. So um, imagine how uncomfortable it would feel to have neuroinflammation. In this state, a lot of systems break down. For example, uh, once the microglia detect a threat, they mount an immune response by releasing these cytokines, uh, and as well also releasing these free radicals, which um, damage, which react with the threat, hopefully. And they also release these cytokines, as I mentioned, which recruit other cells, like astrocytes, and cause them to become reactive as well, which is the term, um, yeah, the term used in this context. And when that happens, the astrocytes can no longer maintain the blood-brain barrier while they're reactive. So as you can see, the blood-brain barrier is breached by these immune cells. For example, that's a lymphocyte. And the immune cells invade the brain to be able to fight the infection. However, this can be pretty detrimental to the other cells in the brain, like the neurons or the oligodendroglia. As you can see, uh, because oligodendrocytes and neurons are very fragile, they can often die, or damage to the myelin can be caused from the free radicals, uh, the free radicals all of a sudden. However, there is hope, and the hope is provided by the astroglia, in something called astrogliosis. 
As you can see, the healthy fission, these astrocytes have um, distinct uh, territories. They don't overlap that much. They contribute to homeostasis. And compare that to um, the situation when a bacterial antigen is injected. They multiply, but they still remain in their spaces. And they also produce more lactates to be able to fuel the damaged neurons. However, uh, you won't get to live happily ever after as those um, astrocytes in the moderate astrogeosis after they return to normal. Because if you're an astrocyte facing severe insult or damage to the tissue, then you will have to leave your domain and form a scar tissue against the inflamed area to be able to protect the rest of the brain. They do this by, um, yeah, by form, as I said, forming scar tissue, but they also recruit these mucopolysaccharides to seed it off. Uh, chitin is a muc mucopolysaccharide, uh, so similar concept, I suppose. And the area that is inflamed, <coughs> as you can see, nothing remains, completely wiped out, dead. So, um, we've just talked about astroglia, oligodendroglia, and microglia. However, there are other glial cells in the brain. So I have, a, I have an honorable mention section to give a big shout out to all my other homies. So you of course remember the Schwann cells, but do you remember the dorsal root ganglion? Formed by the sensory cell bodies, right? Sensory neuron cell bodies, yeah. And those are surrounded by these satellite glia, which have a homeostatic function. And also in the peripheral nervous system, that's other than your uh, spinal cord in your brain, for example in your arms or your legs, I mean center as well, uh, there are these enteric glia, which are found around your circular, circular and longitudinal muscles in the intestines. They basically accompany the neurons. Okay, so that's the peripheral nervous system glia. Now we're back to the brain. You have the Bergman glia in the cerebellum, which have a very similar function to the astrocytes. And then you have the Müller glia in the retina. Look how cute they look, they look like a cute couple. <laughs> or should I say carpal, because they are from the retina of a carp fish. I just thought it was cute, but here are the mulaglia of the human retina. Anyway. And then there are the olfactory and cheating cells. Now their function is pretty much self-explanatory. And I wish that was the case for the ng glia, because I have no idea what they do. Their function might be guiding uh, axons or blood vessels or even replacing dead oligodendrocytes, but no idea. Anyway, there you have it, folks. Um, Neuroclea are absolutely amazing. On the second to final slide, I will give a huge, huge thanks to the professors Alexei Perkratsky and Arthur Butts for making today possible. They blessed us all in 2013 when they wrote this brilliant book, Clear Physiology and Pathophysiology, which is my favorite book to date. <laughs> okay, moving on to the final slide. I would like to end on a less sciencey note. Some of you might be doubting the importance of knowing about neuroglia, and you'll be correct in the short term, uh, in day-to-day -day life. However, exploring the vast sea of knowledge is fulfilling in its own right. You get to learn about all these cells and mechanisms that constitute what you would call life. And it feels special knowing that nothing has gone seriously wrong yet. You will not regret, um, you will not regret looking at the world in a different light the more you learn about your mechanistic existence. Instead, I believe you will appreciate life even more. So when the next opportunity for learning comes, I encourage you to consult Wikipedia or watch a video about it, which is why I suggest some very good YouTube channels. And finally, Whatever your situation in the future, I hope you'll always remember the neuroclear and be grateful that they're letting you think in that moment. Thank you for listening.